Hey gang, we all know Spotify has become the ultimate app destination for music lovers. I have an account and I love it. I find new music by following Tastemaker playlists and I make my own playlist that I share featuring music from guests that have been on the show. But did you know that aside from millions of songs, Spotify now has all of your favorite podcasts, including How Did I Get Here? Yes, all of your podcasts are available on Spotify. Just go to Spotify.com or download the app from your app store. And don't forget to follow How Did I Get Here? That's Spotify. Millions of songs, thousands of podcasts. Let's get down. Attention, Austin musicians and music industry professionals. Are you having a difficult time navigating these tricky waters? Well, the Austin Music Foundation is here to help you. The Austin Music Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to strengthening and connecting the local music community with innovative programs that empower musicians, music industry professionals, and music businesses within Austin's creative economy. With expert panels, consultations, mentoring, and mixers, AMF's programs provide the necessary tools and opportunities to help the Austin music industry succeed. Now look, ever since COVID took over last year, everything's moved online. The consultations are online. They're at no cost to the artist or to the music industry professional. Just go to austinmusicfoundation.org. That's austinmusicfoundation.org to find out how they can help you. Austin Music Foundation is here to help. Let's get down. I'm Johnny. I'm your host. Welcome to the show. I hope you guys are all having a really good week, whatever it is you're doing this week. I have had a very good week. We fit, wrapped up recording uh, at the bubble for the uh, Austin Music Foundation Artist Development Program album. It was fantastic. Been listening to Rough Mixes. Now Frenchie's mixing it all. It's very, very exciting. Very, very exciting. And I cannot wait for all of you to hear it. And, uh, and now that's done. I'm playing uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday this weekend. Um, crazy. A lot of gigs. And a uh, quick update on Rosie on, uh, on Tuesday's show. I was stressed out. Rosie had, had started eating stuff while I was gone. Like she ate a boot on Friday. She, uh, by the way, she was shitting leather until uh, she was not. She shat leather Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And uh, now her, her poop is clean again. Regular poop. No leather in it. She ate another shoe on Saturday or kind of ate the inside of a shoe. And she's getting into the... Garbage. She's just started acting bad and doing bad stuff. But um, but I I've I've been correcting it and uh in a really I've been finding all these new sort of like dog training ways and trying them out. Been watching these videos on YouTube, googling stuff and and really working it out. And I it's Thursday when I'm doing this, and she's really like almost a completely different dog. Like she's chilled out a lot. So ah man, Rosie it takes a lot. It takes a lot out of me. I think. I think I stress out a lot of, about it more than I probably should, but I really want the dog to be happy because I love her a lot and I just want her life with me to be the very best life she could possibly imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so gang, I had a really great treat happen today. This guy, uh, Craig from Guayaki Organic Yerba Mate, you probably know it from the, uh, uh, you know, from the store. They, they have them in cans and bottles. He brought me five cases of cans, all these great flavors, flavors I love and everything. Yeah, man. He brought me uh, sparkling grapefruit ginger, uh, classic gold, which is like their cola, which is the one I really liked. I, I was drinking these at the bubble and I got really into it. And my friend Scott Collins was like, oh, I know this guy. You should talk to him. So I did. And he was like, oh, shit, you like it? Let me bring you some uh, let me bring you some some guayaki yerba mate. So he, he brought me a smorgasbord. So I also got enlightenment. I got orange exuberance, which I have not tried. I have not tried the tropical uprising, and I have not tried the lemon elation. But I got all of these. I also have never tried the blue foria, but I am currently drinking it, and it is delicious. Guayaki Organic Yerba Mate is available pretty much wherever it is you get your your uh, your soft drinks or your energy drinks. You know, the corner store, the Seven Eleven. I see them there. Might be at your grocery store in the yellow can or bottle. Guayaki Organic Yerba Mate. So I want to thank Craig and all the gang over there at Guayaki Organic Yerba Mate for all of these lovely cans. I'll be sharing them with my guests. If you know me, give me a shout. Come over. Enjoy a Guayaki Organic Yerba Mate with me. 
<laughs> Gang, I have a great show for you today. I'm so excited about it. Writer, director, actor, musician. John Valley is on the show today. He has a, a movie, a brand new movie out. You can rent it wherever it is that you, uh, that you do video on demand, uh, namely Amazon, Google, and uh, Redbox streaming. You can rent it from those places. It's a grindhouse Pizzagate satire called The Pizzagate Massacre. It's a great, great movie. And it is a grindhouse movie. It's like a micro-budget movie, but it's, it's beautifully shot, wonderfully acted. John Valley himself is, is a fantastic actor. I talk to him a lot about this. This is John's second time on the show. He was on a few years ago. What had happened was I had seen some Sweet Spirit videos, and I loved them. There was one with puppets for uh, Baby When I Close My Eyes, and I'm drawing a blank on the one that he stars in, and he's kind of this weird dominatrix dude. But uh, I, I loved him, and I reached out to him then, and I was like, hey, will you come on the show? And I, I would just I love his work. I think he's, he's uh, you know, some people, like some musicians, you really love them because whatever song they put out, you like that the song within them. Well, I like the visual song and the story song within, uh, within John Valley. And this movie, Pizzagate Massacre, is fantastic. I'm, you might have read about it. They did a couple of articles about it in Vice uh, uh, because he, uh, he got some death threats. Because it, it, this movie is basically like, uh, it's a dark comedy about how conspiracy theories hurt people and lead to violence. Like, it explores the toxic nature of conspiracy theories and fantastical thinking. Uh, and, and, and people who weaponize misinformation. Much like the Pizzagate incident itself. If you remember it, the Pizzagate incident is something that happened, I think, in 2016, uh, before Trump became president. And uh, Alex Jones... I believe went on his show on Infowars and went on to talk about how uh, liberals and and people were holding having um, like like pedophiles and child sex trafficking from the basement of a pizza shop in Washington D.C. and he named the pizza shop and he gave the directions and then a guy showed up with an AR-15 to do some damage. Luckily, nothing happened. But what John uh, Valley does with this movie is explore. What about what happens when people really do do something about it, when they really do try to go do something about about a conspiracy theory that they've heard about? and It's got them so fired up. Now, we live in this world of these conspiracy theories. So it's pretty it's pretty real. You know, it, it's you, you got all those people that have been at DZ, Dealey Plaza in Dallas waiting for JFK and JFK Jr. to come back and anoint Trump president again. Like just really insane shit is going on because of conspiracy theories. Look at look at January 6th. All the conspiracy theories in that, you know, that led up to that violence. So it's, it's really timely and it really speaks to, to today's uh, sort of insanity with all the conspiracy theories and misinformation that's being passed around. And the movie is fantastic. We have a great conversation about it without really giving away too many spoilers. A movie like this is difficult to make at this time. But John is a really artistic person, and, and he, he wore so many hats from writer, director, producer, actor, uh, 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 wardrobe guy. And he even worked on the—he did the music with Eric Gatling. And the music is fantastic. It's real sparse. It's real synthy. It's got real analog kind of sense. The story's fantastic. The acting's fantastic. We have a great conversation about it. He, the movie was going to be called Duncan, and then he ended up getting some distribution and kind of got some love in the horror world. He sent it out to all the festivals at first, and no one got it. No one accepted it. But now it's gotten some traction. It's available for you to see right now on Amazon, on uh, on Google, and on uh, on Redbox uh, streaming. You can go to the PizzagateMassacre.com to, uh, to find out where you can watch it and to find out more about the movie if you want. Or just listen to our conversation. And to find out more about John Valley, who's a great video director. He's done like, you know, over 50 videos. He's a fantastic actor. He's been in a bunch of stuff. And I'm looking forward to whatever he does next. Because I love his work. So, uh, you can find him at johnvalleyworks.com. Okay? So, without further ado, let's talk to writer-director of Pizzagate Massacre, John Valley. Let's get down. <laughs> She was great, and her husband was like, "How, how do you cast?" <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. Uh, it's just basically you put out the casting call on all the avenues that yeah. are out there, and then 
you just see what you get. We didn't really like have any resources or budget to be reaching outside of town. Right. Uh, but this is a pretty state. rich. It is. It is town. I mean, isn't it? it, it It is and it isn't. You know, it's like that tough thing where there's a lot of really seasoned performers that are in the movie, but a lot of them haven't spent a lot of time in front of the camera. Right. Uh, Just because there aren't that many things being made here. I mean, there's plenty of like shorts and uh, independent things around the university. But as far as like getting your reps in as an actor in front of the camera, I mean, you can be uh, a really well-trained actor and... Uh, quote unquote sharp, but have not been in front of a camera for years sometimes, you know, unless you're like really digging and looking for stuff to get involved with, you know, people kind of write off UT shorts or these kind of smaller things pretty quickly. Right. They shouldn't because right, there's right. great opportunities there and that's how you meet people. But in the case of uh, Pizzagate, it was just putting on a casting call and seeing what we got. And then towards the end, leaning on some of the people who already were cast to help us find people because we were casting right up to the last minute. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, it was a guy that played Duncan. Was he first? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So he and I were cast in a kind of a crime thriller thing that takes place in a bank where you're sitting around the table the whole time for the whole movie, like 12 right. Angry Men style. Okay. And so that cast got really close. We all... You know, seeing each other every day, goofing yeah. around every day. And that actor in particular was cast and we just became fast friends. And uh, because of the energy of the country at the time, this would have been 2017, I think. Um, yeah, like early. No, you know what? It was early 2018. We were shooting this movie and just, you know, everybody's talking about what's going on politically in the country. And he and I quickly found out we have this, you know, pretty bizarre fascination with that kind of fringe uh, culture of conspiracy theories and just sort of watching what happened to it over the years. And it literally was a light switch moment when we started talking about Pizzagate. I had a, a couple of other projects kind of gestating and developing in my head over the course of a few years. We start talking about conspiracy theories and Pizzagate. And it was this kind of aha moment like, oh, I need to write a movie for this guy and this is what it's going to be about. And it was like this feverish, you know, just writing all day. And I, and I popped out this script and showed it to him and, you know, it was just a domino effect. Everybody was pretty into it. And then from there we were able to cast, which from that point of view makes it a little easier to cast once you know who your lead is. Yeah. It would have been awful trying to find him last minute. I don't think I could have even written it. Right. uh, Had I not known that Tynus was going to, play this character right mm-hmm. Tynus that's yeah. his name yeah Tynus So Tynus So what what a great name <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um, the movie is it's really really great and I was so like I've, I've always been a fan of yours I, when you first were on the show it was because I saw your videos and I was like I gotta meet this dude because <laughs> yeah. this guy this guy's this guy's cool like you just have such a great sensibility and um, anyway alright let's get back to this movie I'll blow more smoke up your ass as we go through it <laughs> Um, also you were the wardrobe guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Accidentally. I mean, and that was like, <laughs> you did so much stuff. I mean, right down the, the soundtrack, the, the, uh, the score is great. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I'm, I'm glad you like that. Cause it's, you know, I have a little bit of a music background, Yeah, but by no means would I consider myself. I mean, I guess I can call myself a musician now. I mean, I've been in a band and I scored a movie, but you know what I mean? Like I'm not yeah. traditionally a musician. Um, I'm not an actor, but I have an IMDB page and go. I've been in. Movies with John Hawks and and uh, the guy from Memento, Guy Pierce. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. What, yeah. what movies? I was in one movie with both of them, and I was in their band. Oh yeah. It was okay. one that was filmed here called Slipping Down Life. Okay. Cool. Like twenty something years ago. Anyway, sorry. But it's that same thing, right? Yeah. Like you're not, you you're you're not necessarily like have that on your resume, but right. just the nature of what we were trying to do at that point. Well, you know what I liked about it is that it reminded me of of movies uh, uh, like uh, 70s and, and 80s movies that were of a lower budget where they didn't have like the orchestra money. Yeah. But they used these synthesizers in the creepiest fucking way you can. Yes, you exactly. Know? And it can be a lot more creepy than, than an orchestra. 
Exactly. You know what I mean? For sure. And it has very like nightmarish quality. Yeah. I love that about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah, in that same fashion, it, it's just that like perfect kind of alignment where we are definitely trying to stylistically and thematically pull from that era of film. Yeah. Um, but practically speaking, we were up against the same obstacles they were. You yeah. know, you, John Carpenter talks about how the reason he scored his movies is because he's fast and cheap. Yeah. Not because he has this compulsion to be a, uh, you know, uh, to score movies. Yeah. It's just out of practicality. And everything about making a movie of that scale is, uh, you know, lives and dies with the practicality. You write it for that in mind. You know, you... You build everything so that in a worst case scenario, if somebody has to do it, you can do it. You know, I mean, I had every intention to hire a musician to score the movie. Who's like the guy you did it with? Uh, Eric Gatlin. Eric Gatlin. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good friend of mine. Uh, we do a, a comedy troupe called Playtime Comedy. And it's just like, you know, quick videos that we put together when we're all uh, under the influence. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, just been friends with him for years. And he's a pretty good musician himself and fucks around with that synth stuff. Yeah. Um, so it was just like kind of bringing him on board to make sure that I'm not going completely off the rails. I needed right. somebody who I trusted a little bit more yeah. uh, skill wise and also just emotionally. And, you know, he, he did it for free because, you know, we, yeah. we just work on each other's projects because yeah, yeah. I That's- needed somebody to care about it. Yeah. That's you know. the beauty of independent film is people like a guy that's directing one film might be, you know, doing set decoration and, yeah. and like help in the smallest ways producing their bro who helped them with yep. their movie. You know what I mean? 100%. I love that about that. Yeah. And that's why my name's all over the credits, kind of embarrassingly so. But at a certain point, I, I, I thought it would just it just got funny to put my, you know, just to like say, like, here are all the major departments I worked in. I get it. But but. I mean, to pull off something like that, that was another thing was that like knowing you and knowing how difficult as an artist it is to pull something off. Yeah. Like you made a fucking movie. Yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> and you didn't have a million dollars at even like that. That's like not even anything now in movie making. No, no. You can burn through a million uh, easily overnight. Yeah. You know, if you're not careful. Oh, which, by the way, can I ask you one thing before I forget it? There's there's it's in the preview and stuff. I, I was I was very the second time I was watching. I was like, shit, there's so much stuff I kind of want to talk about. But it would be like I don't want to reveal any plot because it's so fun sure. to watch this movie not knowing what's going to happen. Yeah. But in the preview, there's a there's a there's a lizard person, a reptilian. Yes. It, how did you do that? Man, that's so first. Yeah. No, no, it's all practical. Uh, first and foremost, the the makeup artist that I work with all the time, uh, Jason Vines. He's a Austin local, incredible, incredible. Uh, artist. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I've just worked with him over the years, and we kind of know each other's taste, and we know sort of how to put uh, cobble together things, you know, from multiple sources. So that wasn't like that wasn't a design that you can just go buy. No. You know, that was like two or three different uh, pieces of prosthetic. Um, and we, we recolored it. We, we redesigned it and, and pulled together all these different pieces from other, you know, just online shops of prosthetics and put that together specifically for those shots. Um, so it was all just practical. Actor sat, sat in the makeup chair for four hours put it on we had lunch with him and everything and you know which was pretty fun there's some pretty good bts photos there but uh i'm super proud of how that makeup turned out it looks incredible it's good right yeah 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 Yeah. um costly you know like you wouldn't you you wouldn't be able to afford to do that for like a a lot of days in a row yeah like again it's just everything about this movie was planned out to the t you know we knew exactly how long it was going to be on camera for so we could kind of budget that into the day and budget that into how long Jason spent uh, gluing certain aspects of the costume together. Um, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, sorry. Hi, buddy. Got a little... Uh, oh, no, not a squeaky Rosie, guy. the guest here. Okay, so normally she does come and say hi to the guest, but normally the squeaky toy is not part of her thing. Yeah, okay, here. She's really wanting to show off her toys. Yeah. Sorry, Rosie. Here. This is a quieter toy. Sorry. <laughs> Single parenting a dog in the middle of a, uh, I know, I know. Um, Buddy. So uh, I have one more prosthetic question. Mm. 
and I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it. But Please do. <laughs> it's a fun you one. reveal your manhood yes. in this film. Is mm-hmm. that <laughs> was that a Dirk Diggler uh, uh, wiener in the? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Because it, it's, it's, it's sort of the, your calm, like having it out, was like. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's it's a hundred percent fake. But okay. What was so fun was obviously that day of directing, right? Yeah. You know, and I've got this thing attached to me. It was a a pretty fun day. Uh, but no, like finding out that half the crew didn't know. You know, there, there's people on set, and I'd hear these whispers like, "Is that is that really his dick?" Yeah. At first, I was impressed. I was like, "Wow." <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's why I was like, has anybody, like, have you never seen a dick before? Because it's, I mean, when you see it in person, it's like, yeah, there's no way this is real. But, right. You know, in, in movie land, maybe it, maybe it looks real. I mean, it's photographically real. Yeah. Uh, and the artist that made it is, again, like super talented uh, special effects artist, friend of mine named Ben Plowman. Um, he was on that special effects show called uh, uh, Face Off. I never um, saw it. It's like this sort of reality competition show, you know, in the vein of chef's kitchen, but with special effects artists. So he's like that good. And he's doing stuff for the Mandalorian now. Wow. Um, But, you know, good friend of ours has seen uh, all of these uh, uh, comedy shorts that we did. He's like a a guy that I met through that uh, comedy troupe, playtime comedy. Um, And, you know, it's like one of those things where you get to a certain point where if you're just constantly working on things, you eventually meet these people who go on to be uh, extremely skilled. That's why I say you know? yes. I've, I've always said yes to so much shit, right. even if it seems kind of stupid. You just never know oh, yeah. what you're going to do yeah, or what you're, who you're going to meet, who yes. you're going to work with, what kind of chemistry is going to happen. Yes. Yeah. And that's that. The, the movie lives and dies with that just because everybody who worked on this movie, all the crew – uh, are are the best and the brightest in Austin, and they were just people that I came up with making these cheap music videos with, and that's part of the reason why we pulled the trigger on the movie because it was not cheap for me uh, to to kind of handle. But I just knew that all of these technicians were going to be way out of my weight class very soon. Yeah, and so just pulled the trigger on it because I knew that everyone behind the camera uh, was going to be rock solid. Yeah, you know. So then the challenge became casting this thing because it's very character driven. Yeah. Well, also it looks incredible. Yeah, and that's one of the things you have to say. Like in a in a in a lower budget movie nowadays, like there was a I can't remember what the name of the movie is now, but I bet you saw it. A uh, Kevin Curtin and Jonas Wilson from here did the music for it. Yeah, and it had those those rabbit people. Yeah, I haven't seen heads. it yet, but okay. I know all about it. Kevin was telling me all about it when he was working on it. So but I I saw that and I had those guys on. And one of the things that like. I, my ex-wife is Tracy Gowdy, who was a music video director and yeah. 20 years ago like got started in doing all this stuff. I remember her working on this Patty Griffin video and basically blowing like half the budget because it was this crane shot. Yeah. At the end, she wanted you know, her to be like this and this, this you know, with her arms spread and this camera going up. And, and yeah. like most of the budget was spent on the crane. Like I don't, I don't think she made any money off of the video or anything like that. Of course not. Of course not. No. Yeah. But um, – uh, but it it uh, the opening of, of those guys' movie has this – now that there's drones, mm-hmm. there's no stopping you. Now that the cameras that people can buy, that you don't have to go rent something from whatever lab, you know, yeah. to get some – like things can look really good in your movie. and it's But it's still in the person's eye, right? Yeah. Like anybody can record a record on their computer, but if you suck, you're still going to suck. <laughs> exactly right. exactly there, there yeah there's the application of taste and uh that that has a lot to do with it for sure and our cinematographer like, was incredible incredible yeah incredible yeah yeah and, and like if you tried to make this movie in the 90s it would look like slacker or like right or or uh clerks or something you know what i mean like exactly yeah and the thing the thing though that i because the the uh, people do talk a lot about how good this movie looks and it really does it it's, does it's beautiful um but a lot of that was also knowing that we were punching above our weight class the whole time and so we really designed the shooting to to be something that we could pull off so we really embraced this very kind of worker simplistic uh traditional style of shooting and if you go back and really look at it carefully you can see just how basic some of the shooting is yeah. but i think a lot of the the success of it was just like staying true to that vision 
uh, staying true to that, uh, you know, that voice or whatever, and and not having some awesome drone shot, you know, dropped somewhere in the middle of right, the movie, right? Right. Because we are in this uh, era where you have access to drones, yeah. but you still have access to tripods, like old right. fashioned tripods, right. and we knew just stick to that because if we drop in a drone shot, all of a sudden it's going to look like, you know, oh, we spent all our money on that, and right. and it's and it's going to just throw off the you know, the consistency and and the voice of the, the vision of the movie. Right. If that makes right. sense. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I'm yeah, getting too like yeah. in the weeds about it. No, but, no. Uh, we, we intentionally embrace this really kind of just classic approach to cinematography. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was also like a, uh, there's people with phones and stuff. There's one point where people are filming stuff, but like the, uh, uh, Karen, when she's going to do, she has like a video camera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like a super eight, like a, almost like a nineties or earlier DV kind of like early two yeah, thousands kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, and the cars are all kind of like yep. 70s, 60s, 80s. Yep. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and if you notice too, it's like most people don't change their costumes throughout the entire movie. They've no. got the same thing on the yeah. whole time. And that was part of the design of, again, knowing that we don't have time to do a bunch of costume changes. We don't have time to have a bunch of, or we don't have money to have a bunch of costumes. Uh, as you found out, seeing the credits i did the the costume design because yeah. we we just couldn't find anybody until the last minute um the people we worked with uh, on, on the wardrobe team were great but we, you know we just had so much trouble finding people right um but that was by design thematically and practically because we wanted well i wanted writing it to almost have this like vibe of the simpsons or something yeah. where that that nature of satire yeah where Everything almost has this low animation, this kind of 2D effect. Yeah. Because we knew we were going to be shooting very bare bones. Right. So let's have the costumes reflect that. Let's have the the vehicles reflect that. I mean, we had access to really cool vehicles because obviously they play a pretty big part in the movie. Yeah. But the whole name of the game was matte finish, kind of one color, yeah. very simple shape, just to keep everything very cartoonish and kind of like animated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, before we get into that kind of stuff about it, hang on a second. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't like the sound of this. Rosie, God damn it. <laughs> she's been getting mad and eating stuff of mine. Yeah, I couldn't tell it because like, she it's, picked that it's up. It's all kind of new. Yeah. Like, it's all been happening over the last week or so because I've started playing gigs and having a dog walker come and get her. Um, before we get into all this stuff about the inspiration of the movie and sort of like all that stuff. There was one thing, the second time I was watching it, I was like, oh shit, man, they're using all these guns. Yeah. And this yeah. thing just happened with, uh, with, with Alec Baldwin on that movie. Yep. What, uh, is there, like, did you have, like, a gun hand? I mean, this is a, a lower budget movie. You, you were doing the costume. Like, how did you, what kind of, what was going on with the guns? Yeah. I mean, we had decided early on that we wanted to have... Uh, practical guns and like practical gunfire right um uh for many reasons one of them being that we wanted it to have that look we wanted the the squibs that were yeah yeah. shot that's all real um we wanted it to have that 70s 80s vibe um but also we knew that we just didn't have enough money to spend on uh like high-end cgi gunshot stuff right right um, and we didn't want that to be the thing that tanked the movie. So we leaned into this, uh, you know, blanks. Right. So we hired a really seasoned armor. Okay. Um, all of the weapons were designed for that purpose. Um, you know, if you, one of those situations where if you would have put a real bullet in the chamber, it, it wouldn't work. fire. Right. Yeah, the okay. gun would just explode yeah. in your yeah. hand, um, which is a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> yeah. But, um, man, to speak to that, it's like... Going forward, uh, I think things are going to change pretty dramatically in that field. Um, you know, going forward for myself, I'm you know I, I intend to now do uh, CGI gunfire. Yeah. Um, but it's just one of those things that it has a lot of people in the industry scratching their heads because the amount of things that had to go wrong for that to happen is astronomical. Yeah. You know, we are this tiny. Uh, you know, what's called like micro budget film. Right, right, right. And there's no way in hell that anything like that would have ever happened on our set. Right. You know, I, I think back on every time we used those uh, weapons and just the amount of care and time that was put into 
uh, prepping the cast and crew for what was about to happen. Yeah, yeah. Everybody knew what was going on. It's just, it's it's unreal, you yeah. know, uh, that, that that happened. But it did. And it's it's just sheer negligence, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was pretty sobering when all that stuff was happening, especially it, it literally happened the day that we were starting our PR campaign for the movie. Oh, wow. And so I was spending the first, you know, six hours of that morning recutting this trailer that we were about to put out and just taking out all the gun stuff. Wow. Um, just out of, you know, an abundance of caution yeah. not to be needlessly attached to that. Right, right. You know? Yeah. Um, and, it's, and that's tough because it's a movie, basically, there's a militia. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's pretty integral to the movie. And... You know, we have all the creative decisions behind it and why we did it, but uh, you know that stuff is pretty uh, insignificant compared to what what happened. I think with Rust. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, we were talking a little bit in the kitchen before, like just how amazing it is that you. I mean, when you when you saw the insurrection on January sixth, were you like, "This is exactly this is exactly what my movie's about"? Yes. Like, yeah, yeah. Not to like needlessly take away the the <laughs> severity of that day, but like, yeah, of course. When yeah. when that happened, it was just like, uh, pretty alarming. Um, and I had people from the cast and crew reaching out to me saying like, "Do you think this is going to be good or bad for the movie?" And I said, "Unfortunately, I think it's going to be great yeah. for the movie." And because up until that point, we had had a really hard time getting this movie out there. Festivals didn't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, nobody understood really? it. Oh yeah, yeah. Like like every major festival turned us down. Every festival in Austin turned us down. Um, He's laughing now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we we did uh, find a way to kind of circumnavigate that uh, that part of the process of getting the movie out. But uh, yeah, people thought it. They just didn't know what to do with the material, and that was so much. It, it makes sense now looking back on it. Because when Pizzagate happened in 2016, I remember seeing that and thinking, this isn't funny. You know, I mean, like everyone's laughing about it because it is such a silly concept. Right. And nobody died. Yeah. You know, there, yeah, there yeah. wasn't a pile of right, bodies right. at the end right. of it. Right. So we can laugh at it. Right. And I remember thinking like, you know, I know these people. You know, I'm from a part of the country that has a lot of these types of people that kind of get uh, sucked up into this uh uh, misinformation, disinformation ecosystem. From Iowa, the great state of Iowa. The great state of Iowa. Yeah. Uh, it has changed quite a bit since last we spoke. Yeah. You know, it has turned into a pretty solid red state. Yeah. Um, unfortunately. And my, my dad believed that. My dad my dad was telling me during the thing, like, you'll yeah. see on Tuesday, like, he, there was always a date attached to it. Like, on Tuesday, they're going to come out, and you're going to find out that Hillary Clinton and all these people are pedophiles. Of course. Yeah, I had close family members yeah. that would were... were practically disowning me over the movie you know really going out of the way to call me up and say you have no idea what you're messing with you're gonna you're, you're gonna look like such a fool in a few months what did, what did, but you've gotten you've gotten some death threats i saw <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not as bad as the as as they're making it seem you know to, to, to be completely honest i mean no, when you put exciting. it in a headline yeah, it's yeah. exciting yeah yeah, yeah. It, it lets you know that you are making some ripples and well, as an artist yeah. And I know you, uh, as an artist, you you go you want to you 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 uh it's not shock it's it's you want to make people uncomfortable enough to think. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it, it just it was so emblematic of the purpose of the movie to begin with because all of them I haven't gotten one since the movie's come out. All of them happened before anybody had seen the movie, and so they that's had no idea. Always what they, the way that shit is. Right. They had no idea what they're talking about. Yeah. You know. Which, again, it was just, it was, you're only affirming why I made this movie. And, and you're affirming the themes that I'm talking about in this movie. Um, and it's misinformation. It's the same thing. Yes. It's the same thing. A couple weeks ago or last week, uh, there was a, there was a, a headline where, where it was Brian May from Queen saying that if, if we were starting a band now, we'd be forced to have a, a trans person in the band and have some kind of like uh, foreigner in the band. Yeah. That the headline read like that, so it seemed like he was saying like nowadays. They and but what he was saying is we we didn't have any prejudices, and so we let this gay like it didn't it didn't wasn't even part of the calculus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. here's this he Middle Eastern the, gay dude that was a singer of our band, and we didn't think twice about it. Exactly, that's that's what the story actually was. But I went to this session, and a guy was there like, "Oh, did you see the shit about Brian May?" I was like, "Oh, did you read the article?" And he's like, "No." 
like, yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It was wild, you know, and like, and, and to that point too, like we, the, the, the major death threats came like about a year ago when we first started getting noticed. Uh, that's right. when it was like super grisly. Um, and you know, we kind of talked about it, uh, throughout the year, but it wasn't until, again, once people have a context of what this movie's about and yeah. it's like found a place in their brain, yeah. uh, now when we're talking about it, it is like, you know, I, p- people are surprised to hear about it. It's like, oh, it's been going on for a while, you know? Wow. Um, and again, like they had no idea what the movie was about. Right. Um, they were just, you know, outrage. Told. We live in this culture of yeah. outrage where that's the thing to be mad at someone yes yeah yes and and with no plan no plan afterwards you know because you think about like and then what let's say you you take down this uh uh poor filmmaker from austin and right. then what like what does that do well it's just like the pizza gate guy like the original yeah. like, what was gonna happen exactly. like what, what was what was the end game exactly yes and you the, see that with january 6th. january 6th like what what was gonna happen if they did take over and do the thing yeah take selfies and fuck live facebook from it like i'm here dude exactly you know what i mean exactly yeah. and i don't know how that doesn't just wake them up but it, it just doesn't you know i'm sure there's some there's probably a lot of people that woke the fuck up after that day and saw like how crazy it all got but yeah it's just they get in there and then what's the first thing they do they get in line you know yeah. and they, they start like walking <laughs> through the tour of, of the capital yeah. <laughs> You know, exactly. It's exactly. Like, what, really? Like you're going to go through, you're going to kill these cops. And yeah. You're going to break through these windows and get cut up and get tear gassed. And then you get in there with, with, with like no plan whatsoever to speak of. Yeah. It, it's wild. And if, if anybody was paying attention to what was going on with our movie in that regard, they would know that because of those death threats and because of this attention that the QAnon uh, community put on the movie, that's what blew the movie up. Yeah. The movie was dead in the water. Like, like, like I said, festivals didn't care. Uh, I was showing it to people in the industry. Nobody cared. They're just like, great, whatever, John. And I, I thought I was fucked. You know, I'm out all this money. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm embarrassed myself, basically. And it wasn't until they started saying, let's kill this motherfucker, that then the movie <laughs> got all this attention. So it's like... If somebody did come to my house and kill me, it's like, like you think that's going to stop whatever the fuck it is that you believe in? Yeah. It's like, no, it's just going to totally embolden and, and, and turn our movie into, a, a, into this like, you know, martyrdom situation. Right, right, right. You know? Yeah. And as if a movie is going to like subvert. If, you're, if your movement is that shallow that a micro budget independent film from nowhere can derail it. Yeah, yeah, then it's like, what does that say about your movement? Yeah, it, it's it's madness. It's yeah. crazy, and that's why I'm frankly not like worried about it because well, I don't think that they truly believe this stuff that they're uh, getting behind. I really don't. I, you know, my sister and I have those conversations about my dad. Yeah. Like he he like during the pandemic, he, he like at the beginning of it, we went through a phase where he actually stopped talking to me for a while mm-hmm. because of this stuff. Same. Um, but uh, but he he. One day he was like, have you heard of this Alex Jones? And I'm like, yeah, dad. I mean, I live in a place where in the 90s we used to get high and watch him on, yeah. on Channel 10. He's right down the street. On the, you know? <laughs> on the access thing. And, um, and, and kind of laugh at him. But like, uh, I mean, people, they, they take that shit fucking seriously. Like yeah. they live in that, <laughs> in that weird sort of fear-based thing. Um, so wait a minute. I want to get to some some. Uh... Yeah, I mean, goddamn. We yeah, we could go down a rabbit hole with just I know, talking about. I know totally that in particular, which you know, it's great. That's kind of hopefully a function of the movie is that at the very least. Oh yeah. Regardless of where you swing uh, politically, it it is for everybody. Yeah. You know, that's that's the thing that I'm really happy with with the movie is that you can watch it even if you are a, a ardent Trump supporter or, or QAnon believer. Yeah. You know. It's still a fun. I mean, it's a fun movie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. First and foremost. Yeah. Yeah. It. Uh, yeah. There's. It's funny because those that style of movie. Like I, I, I was born in '68, and so there. I had young mom, had young aunt, younger aunts, yeah, who were like teenagers, and they would just take me to like the drive-in, mm-hmm. and I would see like these movies that you know had that funny looking blood in it, and the scripts yep. like 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 grindhouse movies, exactly. like real movies, and they were. They're fun. Yes. Like the Linklater and uh and and Robert Rodriguez 
Was it um, Linklater? Uh, it was just Robert Rodriguez Tar- Tarantino and, and Rodriguez and Tarantino. Uh, yeah, the Grindhouse. Movies. Grindhouse. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Planet Terror. And... I had a blast watching those. Movies. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's it's that was definitely part of the calculus as well as like I didn't want this thing to, you know, there there was a time in my life as as a filmmaker where you're you're wanting to show the most realistic gore and the most realistic violence and like right. you're really trying to push and and find where that's at. But, you know, over the years, it just dawned on me that like, oh, I don't really like, I don't like to, f- I don't like to see people suffering in movies. Right. And I don't like to see like hyper-realistic violence. Right. And I did this kind of big swing back towards uh, movie violence because it's, it's fun and it's cartoonish. And, and even the, uh, the prop master and, and the, the special effects squib people, when I told them, they're like, what do you want these gunshots to look yeah. like? And I said, like, I want them to look like RoboCop. Uh, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and they're like, no, that's that's like way too fake. Like a, a gun, a pistol wouldn't do that. It would right. just be a hole. It's like right. that's not. I'm not trying to make something real. We're already watching reality play out every yeah. single fucking day. Yeah, yeah. So that was so much of the design of making this movie kind of lifted, uh, sort of uh, surrealist, satirical, kind of cartoonish. It's because, like, I don't want to do what we're watching on the news every day, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I remember they kind of fought me on that. It was pretty funny. And, and when we were making the blood, they're like, well, it would be this dark. It's like, no, I want it to be, like, painterly red. Yeah, you know, yeah. I love yeah. those old westerns when it, like, looks like just house paint, you yeah. know? The, the, only thing, the only thing that I was like, oh, come on, man, when in the movie was when they were like, uh, out of the six television channels in Waco and I was like there's not six television channels in Waco dude like, that was that was the only thing that I was like come on man but I guess anybody wouldn't even think about that oh dude it's the movie's littered with that stuff it's pretty funny the, the main one that we always get is that like uh how long it takes to drive from Waco to Austin you know there was this whole you know a scene that we ended up cutting where they get lost and that's why it takes them all day Right to drive from Waco to Austin. Right, right. Um, that got cut. <laughs> so, like, right. in the context of the movie, he's at six in the morning, and then they get there at night. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> there's stuff like that all throughout the movie, and it's always fun to see, like, when people catch it and stuff. Is to- Toots is the 24 hour donut place on uh, on airport, right? Correct, Amundo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, You're so, one you of the in only with those guys? That. No, no. I mean, we went there, and they had no idea who we were, but uh, we picked it. Uh, f- for all the right reasons, you know, it was what we needed, and they. No, were I mean, just... like now, do you have friends there? Oh, like, can you go through and get a free donut oh. one in the morning? No, no, they oh. were like all business about oh, yeah? it. It was pretty funny, huh. you know. And they, you know, when we when we settled on the the price, the fee for renting the space, you know, she asked for one one penny more on the check just for good luck and stuff. Like they were just wow. very much about yeah. the transaction, and they're like, okay, how long are you going to be here? What are you doing? And because they didn't shut down, they just kept working, which is yeah. great for us. We, you know, from a long enough distance away, those people making donuts look right. like they're making pizza. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I noticed, yeah, the second time I watched it, I was look, I looking for stuff, and I saw the pizza boxes were stacked up in the window to kind of like block. One hundred percent. The camera, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But no, yeah. I mean, they, I don't even know if they would even remember. You know, like my face, I'd have to like really remind them because it's just a couple people running that operation and they're, I think they're pretty like flexed. Yeah. You know, you, uh, you're an incredible actor. Like you're, you're great. Thanks, man. And, uh, there's, there's another thing to you too, that there's a, I don't know how else to say it except for in this weird antiquated term, but the camera loves you. Like (laughs) it really does. Like you really, I went through and watched, um, some shorts and stuff on your website and you're, you're just an, you're an incredible actor and you're, you, you really shine on the screen. Like, I don't, I don't know how to, it's whatever movie stars have that like they come off the screen when you're watching them. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know why. I mean, I, I, I think I kind of look a little strange when I look in the mirror, but uh, <laughs> I think it's one of those things where it's like, you do look like nobody else and it's a very like strong look. Yeah, and maybe I, that's what it is. I have this uh, good buddy of mine, uh, Pat Cassidy, who uh, he's a producer on this new Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is coming out. I'm very excited for him. Um, but uh, he's an Austin guy, doesn't live here anymore, but was here for a while. And he he's always telling me, he's like, 
He's like, stick with the acting thing, man, because he's like, the older you get, the weirder you're going to look. And he's like, you're going to have this Lance Hendrickson vibe to you when you're like in your 50s. Yeah. And then you're going to get cast. And I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate that. I fucking love Lance Hendrickson. But, you yeah. know, uh, no, I appreciate you saying that, man. It's, But it, I, I think a lot of it is just putting myself in front of a camera uh, like since I was a little kid. Um, there, there are actors that I personally know here in town who could run circles around me with their technique. They can run circles around me with their voice, but they just don't get opportunities to get in front of the camera. And that's such a different beast. Yeah. You know, you, you can, you can spend all the time you want in acting classes and you can get real good at running scenes and breaking down scenes and knowing everything about technique. But like just getting used to that camera being pointed at you, especially in the context of this movie, like as you pointed out earlier, there's a scene where, uh, uh, my big old dick is hanging out (laughs) and, uh, you know, just being able to not be phased by the camera. I mean, I still get stage fright uh, all the time, but um, I think that has a lot to do with it because I, I had no time to prepare for that role. I just had to, like, dip in and out. You know, it was just this mad dash to learn the lines because I stupidly thought the character was smaller on paper. And I didn't realize until we were in production and doing yeah. these scenes, it's like, oh, shit, this guy's kind of like, uh, by you know, like he's basically the main bad guy of the yeah. movie, you know, and I just always viewed him as this kind of secondary kind of just fun throwaway character, yeah, you know, and I really underestimated how much time that was going to take up. And so, yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to watch you. Cool. Like that's, I mean, that's where I felt like I, I saw those videos that sweet spirit did, but then when I saw baby doll and I'm like, Oh, that's the guy. Oh, okay. Well, this guy's, there's, there's like <laughs> something a little askew with this dude, like across the board. Yeah. Yeah. He's like some nice guy from Iowa is what he turns out to be. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you a weird question. What, 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 like your, this movie just came out a couple weeks ago. Yes. It's available now. You're doing stuff to try and like spread the word about it. Yep. But have you been working for the last year on something like on the next? Just writing. You, yeah. Yeah. Writing like crazy because fortunately um, when you buy the ticket, you get to take the ride. And now that I've got this under my belt, uh, people who wouldn't give me the time of day are now like taking the conversation a little bit more seriously. So I'm just writing like crazy. And uh, a really fun thing that I found out in the suffering of this movie before it came out, you know, just all the hardship we had with festivals and just nobody in the industry taking us seriously. The thing that we found was this horror audience. Uh, w- once we had um, a producer kind of come on after the fact and he saw the movie and he kind of saw what was going on with it. And he goes, you need to just do a hard pivot into the horror community. This isn't a horror film, but it sure feels like it wants to be and it has vibes of it. Yeah. And so they kind of changed our perspective. And once we started entering into horror festivals, the audiences just loved it. And that that started the the ball, you know, rolling into what is now this like really cool release and we found our audience. So, that said, I've been spending all this time writing all this like cool horror film scripts and, you know, oh, that's like, cool. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. it's a it's a fucking blast, yeah. you know. And I've always it's it's it seems obvious now in retrospect. I've, I love genre films. I love horror films. Me too. Um, but as a filmmaker, you just get so obsessed with this notion of like premiering at South by Southwest or premiering at Sundance or like you know getting into one of these prestige festivals that you you really do start to ignore what it is that you want to make. And so like you know, thankfully, I found this audience that kind of supported me. And told me I'm doing good. Yeah. And yeah, that's what I've been writing. Are just just uh, short, tiny little horror films. Not short films, <laughs> but like you know, right. eighty minute little, just like get in and out kind of you know schlock. Yeah, your your the the, uh, um, uh, the Pizzagate Massacre has that that length. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very much by design. Yeah. You know, I just that's my favorite runtime of a movie. I don't know if that'll ever change. But it's I just, mine too. Th- those ninety minute bursts. Yes. You know, like. It forces you to be really, uh, really careful with every minute you use. Yeah. Uh, it, it strengthens the screenwriting, uh, strengthens the editing. Uh, the original cut of the movie was 105 minutes. Okay. Um, so Still you know, not that long. No, not that long. Mm-hmm. You know, but I mean, I had this kind of sort of 
rule that it's like, no, we got to get this thing as close to 90 minutes as possible. I just think that that works really well. And maybe I'll venture off into writing. You know, I, I have written longer scripts before, but I just don't want to overstay my welcome. We live in this oversaturated world yeah. now. And uh, again, like if I'm going to ask somebody to sit down and watch something of mine, I'm going to make sure it's not boring. Yeah. And I'm going to make sure it doesn't overstay its welcome. Yeah. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. Also, I've, I've, uh, I don't know if I had read it the first time for when you were here last time. Uh, I would hear on all these podcasts, like I've always wanted to write some kind of movie yeah. or something. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, well, th- my friend Kathy Valentine went to like creative writing, got a creative writing or started to get a creative writing degree as an adult. And I was like, well, maybe I should try and go to film school. But then I'd hear these interviews with people that are like, oh, no, I just read the Sid Field book. You know yep. what I mean? And so I got the Sid Field book. Yep. And uh it's a great book. Yeah. Yeah, it is great. Mm-hmm. And uh and you learn all of these like like whatever you kind of see how things are supposed to happen and when they're supposed to happen in a script. Yes. And that's just kind of like there's people that um when you started off as right, you went to you went to school in Iowa, right? Didn't you, you Yeah, yeah, I went to the University school? of Iowa for like two and a half years and it was just uh a bullshit department. And um, happy for the people who got something out of it, but um, uh, I did not. Other than meeting great uh, collaborators, and um, you know, just ha- having having uh, that group of people to uh, encourage you to work. Yeah. But as far as the yeah the the, the film school, I mean, yeah, you 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 could trigger me really fast. <laughs> Have you written other full length? I mean, maybe probably right. Yeah, yeah, yeah a but lot. this is just the first one you've made. Well, technically, yeah. uh, it's it techni- the first one that came out. Technically, yes, yeah, the yeah. first one that has ever come out, and uh, this is actually my fifth feature. Wow. Yeah, so I, I I made four, but they were always like during school, and they were for a project. So I always kind of consider those like student works. Um, so this is like the first one that. You know, we had a full fledged crew. There was there was like actually kind of a budget, um, and it was it was pretty serious, you know, and, and like like kind of not fucking around. Whereas everything else was, you know, we'd shoot for a couple hours every other weekend or something, and just piece it together. And there was no stakes, you know, nobody nobody was getting paid. You weren't spending any money on it, so they were, uh, you know serious efforts and you know we we were shooting we we wanted them to be bigger than they were but uh alas they you know lived and died with the school right yeah well that happens yeah um, of course so uh, your horror like what are you are you focusing on any certain sort of thing with horror yeah or? i i am a i'm a big cronenberg fan okay and so this thing yeah, i'm yeah. writing right now is is pretty like body horror centric um Small, kind of just like uh, I, I'm, I'm really reducing the cast on this one because uh, Pizza Git has like a pretty huge cast. Yeah. Um, so this one's much smaller, kind of intimate, single location type thing. Um, but I tend to I tend to get into those creature type type of movies. I mean, one of my favorite horror films is The Shining, but I I have a hard time wrapping my head around how to write that stuff. Yeah. You know, it seems like it's very easy to write it, uh, and and just do kind of a bad job at it. You know, because there's the rules are so spongy yeah, yeah. and I find myself getting really hung up on rules right. and, and kind of that's what drives me. I mean, you brought up Sid Field earlier and it's like, I, I outline like crazy. I take a very militant attitude about organizing and, and uh, scheduling and, and timing these things out because that's like the only time that you have control over the movie. Like once you get about a month out from making one of these things and it's too late. You can't back out. You've already got people lined up. Right. And of course, once you start shooting, you got to just, you know, let the thing happen. Yeah. So I take this kind of psychotic approach of, of like really every single shot, every movement, all the blocking, it's all figured out ahead of time because it's going to go, it's, it's going to turn into chaos once you start shooting. So you got to have that like background. So that said, it's like the notion of writing a, you know, supernatural, piece like that is kind of hard for me to wrap my head around whereas if you have like the body uh in in the case of like a cronenberg film you know you're you're very much contained to that apparatus you know and so it's very physical it's very visual it lends itself perfectly to the medium itself right so you can kind of wrap your head around how to organize that a little bit more 
But stuff like The Shining just blows me away. It's just like, how do people write that stuff? Cronenberg do Phantasm? No, that's um, uh, that's a. Uh, Cronenberg did The Fly. Cronenberg did The Fly. He did Videodrome. Ah, uh, Videodrome. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Crash, um, Naked Lunch. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's kind of my he's kind of my guy right now. Um, and and I, I don't have like a singular favorite. I sort of move through phases. Like I think like Pizzagate was very much a like Sam Peckinpah, John Carpenter sort of obsession. Yeah. Whereas now it's kind of more into this like Cronenberg world that I'm I'm stealing from. I had a I had a big Sam Peckinpah. I I went through some different phases during the pandemic where yep. I focus on different people. And uh, and I had a peck and paw thing, and I read this thing about, uh, or maybe in that, uh, yeah, because I read that Easy Riders and, Ra- and Raging Bulls, yep, a book, and bought the documentaries. I went full on like, yeah, <laughs> cinema dude, uh-huh. and uh, I I found out that he had he had he was directed he had directed the first uh, like a bunch of the first season of The Rifleman, yep, and and you can find that shit pretty easily for free. Mm-hmm. And speaking of being able to tell a story in a short period, dude, those are like twenty-two minute, oh yeah, mini epic stories. Like yes. they're amazing. Yes. If he hadn't shot his career, I mean, he he is kind of the right the 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 arbiter of his demise, I right. think. But like, if if he hadn't had that uh, issue with addiction. Um, I think he would be on, you know, everyone's list. Like, like he's on the uh, Mount Rushmore of filmmakers. Right. Uh, the the efficiency um, of storytelling, like you're pointing out. Yeah. Uh, the execution, especially uh, contextually speaking, during that time. Yeah. Nobody had seen action scenes shot like that. Right. You know, it was blowing people away, and that's why he then goes on to be this uh, king of like the the neo western and sort right. of this uh, next phase after the. John Ford and kind of John Wayne era. Right. Um, Where they're more anti-hero kind of guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This like post-Vietnam world or even like in the 60s, this this kind of like, you know, we're, we're more into rule breakers as opposed to, you know, America's best. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Um, here's a question that just I just popped into my head. I, I've been going through all your stuff. I was like, oh, that movie was called Duncan at first. And yep. then it had a different poster that had like a Rambo looking Duncan and stuff <laughs> <Yeah>. on it. <laughs> And I was like, oh, I'm glad that you chose to uh, to change the name because, yeah, Duncan didn't really say anything. Like the Pizzagate Massacre is like, how how did that how did that how did that change? Yeah, so it, did it, someone tell you? Somebody told me to change it. Yeah. Uh, it was part of it was contractually obligated to do so, um, and for good reason. And I'm glad we did. Um, but I'm also glad that it was Duncan for so long because I think that kept everybody grounded subconsciously because. We're not trying to take down QAnon. We're not trying to take down Trump supporters. We're telling the story of this character. Right. You know, and so that's why the movie was named Duncan, because it's about this character. Right. Uh, and, you know, we, we wrote on that title for about two years or so through the festival circuit. Um, and then by the time we had finally gotten to this place where we found our horror audience, the distributors that picked us up were horror centric and you know, right in line with that, they just, they, they said, you got to change the title to something more punchy, something a little bit more loud. Um, because you know, if you put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's going to find this movie they're let's say they just like rip their bong and it's like midnight and they're just surfing through Amazon. Yeah. Are they going to stop on Duncan or are they going to stop on the Pizzagate massacre? Yeah. You know, and so I, I, I understood that. And um, so we, we bounced around a couple titles, and that's the one that we landed on, which is cool because Texas Chainsaw Massacre is yeah, yeah. Uh, like a Bible for me. It's, it's my favorite horror film. Um, and, you know, we shot it in Austin. Yeah. There, there's like shots that are ripped right out of Chainsaw. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Like, like all the stuff with it. the van. You've never seen the Texas no. Chainsaw Massacre? No. Oh, dude. You, you got to check it out, man. It is like such a bizarre movie and yeah. again contextually speaking when you 1974 if you just put yourself in that headspace of people seeing this it, it's it it's shocking yeah. even to today's standards it's it it still works really well it's fucking weird but if you liked uh the easy riders and raging bulls you're gonna love this movie like okay. like do you like easy rider oh yeah movie? i love easy Rider. so it's got that vibe it's like a horror film but with that like kind of chaotic sort of drug 
fueled, you know, shooting style, and yeah. it's really gritty and nasty. Yeah. Um, it's like 16 millimeter too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and, and uh, Toby Hooper had just his the feature he did before it was a, a documentary. So he's got this like docu style approach to yeah. uh, cinematography yeah. that lends itself really well to this movie because the whole idea when you were watching it was that it, it was a true story, you right. know, and that you, they wanted to really seat you into this world. But it's also a practical decision because they had to move fast. Uh, they had to use natural lighting and everything. So it it. It was something that was really perfectly designed uh, for the th- thematic nature of the movie, but also yeah. the practical nature. Yeah. You know, I, I guess you got to see it. Yeah, I do have to see it. Yeah. It's uh, incredible. I guess Blair Witch Project, you know, when I went to go, when mm-hmm. I, I went to go see some movie and there was a preview for it. And I remember when we walked out of the preview, it was me and a few other people. And we were like, I never, I don't remember reading about that story and really thought it was like real until yep. we went to go see it or whatever. Same. Yeah. Same. I, th- I remember thinking it was, I mean, I was, I was like. I think that came out in 99, so I, I yeah. would have been like 13. So I'm like right. perfect audience to believe in that shit. Uh, but then I remember a few years later, the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out. Right. And they do this great like uh, quote unquote found footage sequence in the beginning where it's like black and white 16 millimeter oh, really? footage of like the crime scene and the police walking through the crime yeah, scene. Yeah. And I remember seeing that and thinking like, wait a second, like I can't like – was this real? That this can't be real. Yeah, like yeah. the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is not real. But like the way they presented it with this opening scene of the remake wow, is like awesome. terrifying. Yeah, it's the one that they did here, the remake. I believe they shot it here. Yeah, it's it's like the Jessica Alba one is kind of the 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 you know how you would differentiate I, it from the others. I think that's the one. A friend of mine was uh, the guy that passed away, Mark Levy. Did you ever know him? Oh, I, I know of him for sure. Yeah, uh, I, I think he was he was Leatherface. Really? Like, or the double or something for Leatherface? Oh, fuck yeah. He was yeah. a big dude. Cool, Remember? okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I buy that for sure. It's it's actually not bad. Like, like, I think it's maybe one of the better ones of the entirety of that franchise. And that franchise is all over the place. Yeah. But it's it's quite good. Yeah. Yeah. What about those new Halloweens? You like those? Did I do. Did you see that light, the latest one? I do. I really dig them. And, and, that, and that, uh, the newest one, it's like, I get why people have this critique that, you know, nothing happens, you know, because right, right. it, it is just kind of this freight train of uh, chaos. But um, I really, I don't know. I got into it. I really like that world. I love John Carpenter and they're doing a really good job of sort of like uh, tapping into that spirit while not also right. being like derivative yeah. of it. Um, so I've, I've really been enjoying them. And I kind of like Rob Zombie's uh, remakes as well. I don't I, think they're terrible. I tried to get into some Rob Zombie last yeah. year in a horror era that i was going through and yeah. watching stuff every day and uh I, I didn't it didn't connect with me i mean i could see it's good and it's intense yeah and it's very yeah I, rob I would, zombie i would agree with you it, yeah. it doesn't really attach it, i don't connect with it fully but he him like if you ever get a chance to listen to interviews where he's just talking about movies or just being interviewed as a filmmaker right they're fascinating like he's he's re- a really good listen and has a really good perspective on what it is that we're doing oh, you know check that and, out. and yeah. has that kind of like let's not forget these are supposed to be like shows yeah you know they aren't this like uh like hyper serious like everybody shut the hell up and like we're gonna tell you some like real right, truth right, here right. you know he he does embrace the abstraction of the medium which i which i really like yeah um and it has made me appreciate his movies a lot more knowing kind of where he's coming from yeah um at the same time, though, I don't think movies should be beholden to that. I think they should kind of live and die by themselves. But it's one of those cases where if, if you kind of listen to some of his longer interviews, it kind of changes the uh, perspective of what he's doing. Right. You know, I started listening to an interview that you did this morning with some people that were filmed. I can't remember what the name of the show was. Is it the Paper Street? Uh, Maybe it was a podcast. guy and a lady. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 They're great. Yeah. I love those two. Um are there, there's, there, I mean, are there like, are you getting on, are there horror, there's got to be horror movie podcasts. There's a podcast. There are, there's yeah. There's 1,000 podcasts at least about everything. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So those have been the vast majority of the podcasts I've been able to do. And uh, there's usually some that'll be attached to the, some of the festivals that we're getting into. And so I'll do it's stuff a, that's exclusive for the festival. Right. Are yeah. you, are you, I mean, there's... <laughs> There's a part of me that's like, all those people turned down Duncan, and when you said, when then we changed the name, I was like, oh, now you can go back to those festivals. Yeah. Same ones and be like, hey, it's... 
Yeah, yeah, I've thought about doing that. Um, <laughs> but I mean, aren't you kind of like fuck you guys? A little bit, yeah, a little bit. And I and I'm I'm trying to do my level best to like take that out of my head, just because it's not it doesn't serve me per se. But like, I'm pretty upset by it. I'm pretty burnt by it because the process then revealed an, an aspect to the film festival uh, apparatus and the industry that is just really disheartening. You you quickly find out that, uh, and it's not really a secret, I suppose. It, it sounds kind of obvious in retrospect, but like, you really got to know people in the festival. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're if if you think about what it is that's actually going on, where they're getting if they're getting thousands of titles or thousands of submissions, there's no fucking way they can watch those clearly, like every single one. When they say they watch every single one. I believe it, but I think what that means is that they have a team of, of screeners right. that are watching sure. every single one. Yeah. And those screeners are like unvetted. Uh, they're not being paid. Right. Uh, you know, it, it's just so problematic or it, it's so just like doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it, you get really sobering uh, numbers insofar as like you realize how cannibalistic film festivals are, mm-hmm. that they are sort of about – uh, people pulling pulling the lever on their connections at at the cost of thousands of filmmakers spending all this money on yeah. entry fees, and you realize the whole thing is propped up by these filmmakers, and yeah. then all the people that buy uh, overpriced tickets to see celebrities, you know. And I underst- I understand it from the festival perspective that like they got to put asses in seats. Right. I mean these these guys work in the margins. You know, when right. South by went down, they were firing people like within days oh, yeah. that had worked there for over a decade. Yeah. And it's like, what does that say about the, the sustainability or, or the, the foundation of one of the biggest film festivals in the, in the world? Yeah. You know, it means that they're working on very thin margins. And so I get that you gotta, you gotta get people to come in you know, nobody wants to spend their, uh, uh, spring break uh, flying across the country, gambling on movies that they have no idea who the filmmakers are or right. who's in them. I get that, but the other side of it, it's just, it's pretty disheartening and it's very upsetting. I don't know how else they're supposed to do it. Right. I don't think film festivals should go away by any means. No. And some of them are really well run, and some of them are doing it for very great uh, reasons. But I- the big ones that filmmakers really obsess over. It's just, yeah. it's, it's not the best. There's thing. a lot of like, I mean, I'm surprised there's not like the Conroe, Texas Film Festival, but there might be. The what? The, what Conroe it, <laughs> Film I mean, there's just like so many, like I've got friends that make independent movies and, and star in them and they're like, oh, I just won Best Actor at the Amarillo Film Festival. <laughs> You're just like Amarillo Film Festival. Exactly. Yeah. And that's typically yeah. what it is, you yeah. know. But that's that's what's interesting is because I think these other film festivals have just gotten too big for their britches. And so now these tinier regional film festivals are starting to get more eyes on them from the industry. Uh, the the digital you know world that we live in now makes it a lot easier for them to uh, to operate. You know the the overhead is a lot lower. Um, and it, frankly, it was those festivals that got us noticed. Yeah. You know, and I think those same festivals ten years ago wouldn't have you know had any impact on the future of our movies, but yeah. it was those smaller festivals that still kind of have some heart and, and still have a little soul with like wanting to show cool movies. Yeah. Cause again, like I said to you earlier in the kitchen, it's like, I know I didn't make citizen Kane, but I know I made something that's fun. Yeah. And so then you go to these festivals and you see what is screening and just how boring so much, so much of this yeah. stuff is and how much it just panders to some sense of trend or, like what what it what like they're trying to align with some notion of PC culture yeah. that just sucks all of the like grit and soul out of these movies you know and and I'm all and I'm not talking about like the how much inclusion is being here we go like like I'm doing yeah. the Brian May thing right uh where it's like I'm not saying that we shouldn't be more cognizant of um in- inclusivity and and like lifting up voices that have like historically been marginalized right like that stuff is awesome and i think that's great and yeah. i love to support that stuff but i think that if you really take a close look at these festivals they're just doing it for the cred yeah i don't think they really care about 
the ramifications or the consequences or or like what happens to these people once they do get into the festival. Yeah. I think it feels like a lot of just pandering to their stakeholders or pandering to the outside world because, you know, they just want to make sure that when people go to look at the Instagram account of some of these festivals that they're they're seeing uh, appropriate representation, as yeah. they should. Yeah. But when you turn it into a... I don't know what, like how to describe it. When you turn it into a product, it really like gets gross to me. I don't like to see that when you, yeah. when, you when you see that like oh they're just using that as a as a uh, a brush in their their paintbrush set. Right. They're not actually trying to like uh, do anything uh, su- substantial for that community. Right. You know, it's like they're using them. It feels like. Yeah. You know, the closer you look at it, and you have to make a movie, and you have to go through that like tedious long-winded experience of getting uh ultimately getting denied from these festivals yeah but you just stare at them and look at them long enough and you realize like oh you guys are like some of these people are just so fake right it's just all totally bullshit, yeah. yeah you know speaking of which when you uh did you did you wrote karen as an african-american yeah because there's i mean there's a lot of stuff that happens throughout the movie that correct she has to be yeah. for it to take yeah 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 um you know, I think sometimes you can write things that are uh, that a man or a woman could play. Yeah, uh, you could write something that uh, a- anybody from any uh, ethnicity could play. I-, I-, I get that can happen, but I don't know if it's just the subject material that I write, or um, I had a really great professor in college. It's like kind of the best thing that I one of the best things I got out of my college experience was this uh, directing teacher. Uh, in the theater department, um, who, as far as I can remember, was like the lone African American in in the department, and so she was very much uh, the um, vanguard for like making sure that we're not just putting a bunch of white people on stage all the time. Mm-hmm. And she would uh, host like August Wilson's uh, plays, and like the, you know, I think when I was there, there was some really big anniversary that happened with August Wilson, so we had this huge season of. Uh, August Wilson plays, which are predominantly African American right. uh, characters that are specifically written for African American right. characters, and I, I got quite a bit of pushback in the early days for doing that, for writing something that was so like inherently. It's like, no, this has to be a black woman, yeah. Because first of all, they're like, well, what is a white man doing writing writing a, a story for a right, black woman? Right, right, you know, which is infuriating. Right, um, but it, it it it's it's just it is what it is on the paper. You know, like right. you can't, you, you couldn't put a white woman in that role. And I don't, I don't know how much I subscribe to this like colorblind theory of casting. Right. I think that you, you ought to be very cognizant of who you are casting in, in your uh, projects because it's going to say something one way or another. Right. You know, and you need to be cognizant of that. Right. Um, and, and this professor, uh, Tish Jones, was uh, very much about that and i and i I really really believed in that because there was a big backlash where you know all these grad students who had spent all this money and all this time going to this department then all of a sudden they're looking at the season of plays and they're like well i can't i don't i don't get to be in any of these plays because i'm white right and it's like no you don't yeah because these are these are stories uh about the black community right and you're you're like it would be foolish it would be embarrassing right to, to think that you're being progressive by putting a, uh, uh, white yeah. people in the roles of African Americans. Right. And I don't, I don't, I don't see any issue with that. And, and people, people did get pretty like upset with me. I had some like people, uh, you know, this, this person that I really looked up to and she, she kind of like, you know, talked some pretty like mad shit about me behind my back about like, you know, John has no business telling this story, you know, and it's, I don't know. I mean, when you see the movie, it's like, yes, yes, I do. Yeah, you totally do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I do have business doing yeah. it. Um, a- anyway, yeah. So it, it's it's silly to think that that's not an issue. Yeah. It's clearly an issue. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, have you been doing any videos Music over the videos? last, yeah, over the last couple years? Man, I shot five this year. No shit? Yeah, which is crazy. I... I did not intend to do so, but I just kind of uh, wound up doing that. Um, you know, I'm by no means uh, 
retiring from music videos. I just don't have a lot of time for them now because I'm really trying to keep this momentum going with feature films. Yeah, you should. Um, but no, I'll always keep doing music videos. Um, I love them. I think it's a great medium. It's perfect, a perfect ground to learn how to make feature films because yeah. they basically are the length of a scene. You know, the average length of a scene is usually two and a half to three minutes. Yeah. Um, and the coolest thing about music videos that you learn really quickly is you have no time to be boring. And it's the same, th- it's the same mountain that uh, musicians face, like rock musicians or pop musicians, yeah. is that you got you to gotta do something pretty fucking interesting within 30 seconds yeah. or they're going to change the station. That's exactly right. You know, there, there's this disposable nature to uh, pop music and, and uh, feature films, but yet they, it's, it's this strange duality where as disposable as they are to people, it's also the, where people spend the most money. You yeah. know, and kind of uh, put their money where their mouth is, so to speak. So you better kind of meet that challenge. Yeah. You know, and it's weird as disposable as, as it is, there are those two things that, that stay with you forever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's like, uh, you could hear a song in your seventies that like immediately portals you back to high yeah. school or something. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty powerful. I still stand by the greatest movie day of my life. My mom used to be into the, uh, well, this movie's over. Let's just go watch that movie, you know? Hell yeah. Like, so we'd go to movies like all day sometimes. And one of those days was Foul Play and Heaven Can Wait, the Warren Beatty one. Oh, cool. And Warren Beatty, that's my favorite movie. Uh, sorry. Heaven Can Wait? Heaven Can Wait's my favorite movie. Oh, cool, yeah. cool. I've, I've, I've only seen it once. I saw yeah. it in college, but. I love it. Yeah. I love him. I love him. I love I something about him and just sort of like, and it was reinforced in that, uh, in that, um, Easy Riders and Raging Bulls is just his, like, he saw this career as being, like, a cute yeah. actor in, like, shitty movies. Just kind of the same kind of thing that McConaughey did. Like, yeah. well, it, I'm going to I'm gonna own this the property, the IP, and I'm going to be in charge of everything, and yep. I'm going to be in fucking good movies and not bullshit movies. Exactly. You know? Exactly. It's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's an interesting filmmaker, too, or, and, and, and just, like, actor in that sense that, like, he just fits into the medium so well. Yeah. When you talk about how you said earlier, like, you know, the camera loves you. It's yeah. like there are actors that y- you wouldn't necessarily say are good actors, but they're aw- – like, you love watching them because there's something about the medium that is beyond uh, the craft of acting, yeah. you know? And it's like there are some people that just fit in front of a camera yeah. and, like – they they just live in that world really well. I I, I totally feel that about the, the lead of Pizzagate. It's like that guy is just like like everything he 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 did. It's like you just put a camera on him and it's it's yeah. immediately alive. Yeah, I don't know what that is about people. It's pretty pretty awesome. And and it's like a very unassuming leading man. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yes, but yeah. also just as much you know power. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. I mean he he's. He really brought it and, and kind yeah. of carried that movie. But yeah, it's it's an unconventional uh, lead character for a movie for sure. Yeah. yeah. And there's this huge life going on inside this guy that just kind of gets revealed as like an onion. Yes. You know, as if as the movie goes on, where you're just like, oh my God, oh my God. You yeah, know? yeah. And it's, it's it, the, his sort of like odd kind of quiet life that he lives is like this brooding shit inside of him. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Pretty intense. And the fact that he's always, I don't know if this, this probably doesn't spoil anything, but just the fact that it, it's set up, it, when you first see him, he's hanging out, protecting somebody for free mm-hmm. that he doesn't even really like, mm-hmm. <laughs> but he believes so strongly in the First Amendment yes. that he has to make sure this lady gets safely in and out of work. Protect her, yeah, protect her free yeah, speech. Yeah, it's just so funny. Yeah. What yeah. an interesting, like, weird dude. Yeah, because, I mean, these, these uh, lo and behold, these people, that uh, the, the basket of deplorables are people, you know, and they're, they're, they're your dad. They're, you know, like yeah. my, my family members. Like, they're our neighbors. Yeah. And, and they're, like, living and breathing people. And... It's very easy to cast them aside as like caricatures, which is kind of like what the movie tries. It starts off as a cartoon. Like these are two dimensional like people that we just get to laugh at. And then, as, like you said, as the movie progresses, it gets closer and closer to reality. Right. And you realize just kind of how like dense and, and like deep these people are, you know. It's like everyone is. And that, everyone. Yeah. And that's funny that you do. You, 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 uh, 
you opened up the humanity of someone that mm-hmm. people like us just make fun of from afar. Yeah. You're like, oh, this is a person and this is this is their struggle. This yes. is what they this is how far they've come from, you know, where they started or wherever, you know. Uh, I'm trying to say this without without saying anything specific <laughs> about the movie. But um and, and that's the one thing that this era of division it's nobody's looking at anyone else as a human being, you know? Right. Yeah, on both sides. Yeah, on both yeah. sides. You're right. Yeah. Um, and th- that was very much part of the design just because, you know, what I'm, I'm not going to, like, just make something that straight lampoons them the whole time. It's right. like we see that every night on late night. We see that on SNL every weekend, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know? Um, and not to say that what they're doing is wrong. I think, you know, like there, there's, there's a, quite a story to be written about comedy during the, the, the Trump era. I mean, a lot of people think that it like died, but I think something pretty interesting happened. Uh, comedians took a, a much different uh, or became a much different uh, persona in our, in our uh, culture, I think, because of the, the, this like Trump era, this continued Trump era. Right, right. But point being is that, yeah, the last thing I wanted to do was – spend three and a half years like trying to champion a flat character that i hated yeah you know so i had to like whatever you end up doing it's got to be something that you love and that you want to sit with and i just really by no means condone what this guy did at the center of pizzagate but man i understood it you know like and i knew those people and i know that pain yeah and i know how much it can delude you and take uh, otherwise highly intelligent people which duncan is like you see in the movie there's points where he's like really really intelligent and he like gets what's going on and he knows what he's doing but there's then this like m- like really deep delusion that's that's uh causing everything to fall apart which is what we're observing we're just we're observing our neighbors our family members uh stricken with this uh uh pretty dangerous uh degree of delusion yeah you know, and it's it's sad. It's very yeah, sad. It is very and sad. The last thing that we should do is like cut them out. Right. You know. So yeah. That that was kind of the angle with the movie for sure was to like speak to that. Yeah. Because yeah, nobody else was. Yeah. You know. I've already told a bunch of people to watch it just today. Good. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, I did. man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Even Bob Schneider and Patrick Armstrong. Good. Yeah. I would be curious to see what those guys think of it for sure. Because it's like it's. It's also very Texas, you know, and like, yeah. like you guys understand like the Texas scene pretty yeah. thoroughly being like touring around and stuff. Yeah. You guys get the full uh, spectrum. Yeah, I don't know what road they were on in between Austin and Waco. I've only seen 35. So yeah, that was one of those things where I was like, I wonder which way they're, would you just film that? Like, oh, it's oh. all around Austin. Yeah. yeah and you, yeah. there's the, uh, there was one, th- one scene where I was like, oh, there's the thing that when I'm playing gigs and coming home like driving at night from Houston after a gig when you get to like three thirty, four in the morning yep. and then the red sign, the pecan place. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's in there. And I was like, ah, oh, the pecan place. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah, we just cheated all that stuff just cause again, it's like, that's, that's sort of the Liberty the movie gave us is that we're not making a documentary by any means. So yeah. we cheated everything. We, we didn't shoot anything in Waco. We, we wanted to, yeah. but then the way that the schedule shook out, it's like, there's just no time or no. Yeah. Um, I first noticed that I lived in Miami. Uh, I was born in Miami, but I lived in Miami. I lived here as a teenager. My mom died. I moved to Miami yeah. and lived there. And it was uh, 1985, 1986, Miami Vice era. Yeah. Hell and, yeah. you know, growing up and knowing Miami, when you're watching Miami Vice, they'll like like be driving down a street, turn left, and then they're like 15 miles away from where they turn yes. left. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> that's the first place I ever noticed that. Where I was yes. like, oh, oh, okay. I guess that's what they do. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's, there's no way that we could have, I just, no. uh, yeah. Unless we would have like gotten some more money and broke up the schedule or something to go to Waco, but it just didn't need to be, Yeah, you know, it's not what the movie was about per se. And, and then it just turns into fun things that people get to like, if you're from the area, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and this movie definitely has that. If you, if you live in Austin, it's like, it's pretty fun to watch it and see yeah. all these, you know, uh, locations. And a lot of them are gone now. Yeah, there was one city, uh, one city shot that was seemed like it was across thirty five facing downtown, and I was mm-hmm. wondering if you shot it like on the porch of those new condos there. Yeah, basically, like we 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 just kind of went up the hill. Uh, Rosie, if you unplug this, I'm gonna fucking kill you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 
Yeah, yeah, good job. Rosie, the Riveter. Right. Uh, yeah, that, I think I know what you're talking about. It's where it's looking at the Frost Tower. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it's like this place now that's completely consumed by uh, apartment buildings. Yeah. Um, but at the time was just like a, a little grassy knoll that we kind of like. Oh, right, because you shot it in 2018. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, which it's only three years ago, but a lot has changed since. God, but also like, man, I, that's, that's the thing that always kept me out of acting and movies and just, yeah, it's too long. <laughs> oh, it sucks. Like, yeah. I don't want to make a record and have it come out three years later. Dude, yeah, it's maddening. And, yeah. And, and that's why it's so important to pick something that, and, and like, it's, it's like I've done it lo- enough now to know that like, you better pick something that you care about because it's a fucking nightmare yeah. to try to be like doing something like this yeah. for a movie that you, you like stopped caring about two years ago, yeah. you know? Uh, it, it, so that, that, that then comes into choosing what you're going to make. Right. But um, yeah, like, like that's, that is a really shitty aspect of feature films is that uh, there, there's this, aspect of how long it takes to make them and then you're judged on the moment that it comes out right Just like like exactly four years of your life can be judged within like uh, a three to four day window of time sure whereas if you do television like the the whole idea with those things or, or series is that you are kind of supposed to discover them and they're supposed right. to like be long-winded and like you can make a a series that comes out and then does well a year later because let's say you know in the case of like what Danny McBride's doing and like the Rough House production guys and uh, David Gordon Green and Jody Hill, like with Vice Principals uh-huh. or right, right, right. Uh, Eastbound and Down or Righteous Gemstones. It's like those micro successes across all those series then beget more success for the other series. Right. You know, they, they all just kind of like dovetail into each other. Right. Whereas a movie, it's like you spend all this time, even at the top level, it's like, yeah. it fucks people's careers up if they have like a bad weekend for an otherwise yeah. good movie. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a very weird medium. And like they call that. it movie prison, or movie jail or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all the terms for that. In. Yeah. Um, do, do you ever have any, do you have any interest in ever uh, uh, like directing something somebody else wrote? I would love to do that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I was yes, wondering, it's like, yes. either he's like super controlly and like, I want to be the guy that does all this stuff no. or like, Dude, I'm doing it because I have to. If there was a guy writing and a yes. guy editing, I'd be stoked. That's exactly what it yeah. is. And I, I will say that having having uh, done this movie now, I, I did just kind of like broke some sort of ceiling for myself with writing where I, when it worked, I was able to look back on it and say, oh, I know exactly why that's working. It yeah. wasn't a fluke. Right. So now I know how to do that. So writing has become a lot more interesting to me in that uh, manner. However, I would still love to do somebody else's script because the the uh, the job of directing is very different than the job of writing. Yeah. And you approach it differently. And I know from the few times that I've done other people's material, I know that I'm a different filmmaker. And I think as objective as I can be about my own work, uh, I think that I do a better job when it's somebody else's material, huh. you know? And I think a little, bit, a little bit of that exists with these music videos because those are essentially like somebody wrote the script for you. This is how long it is. This is what you are going to be filming is this little, you know, three minute right. song. Right. And that is definitely where I found a lot of my uh, technique and like kind of, it's almost as though I, I cut my teeth more with music videos than I did with the four features that I made right, right. ahead of time. I feel yeah. like those features almost served as just a like uh, training camp of like getting that stamina to be able to yeah. like, uh, raise up the barn and then take it back down again. Right, you know. Right. Um, but working on other people's material like it is just fundamentally a different thing than shooting your own material. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but the the problem is is that at this level. If there's a script good enough to be shot at this level, it's not going to land in my lap. Right. You know, people are buying those and they're going, they're going up to the next level. Right. Um, yeah, I don't have access to that. I, and I, I know plenty of good writers, but, yeah. you know, writing a script is not easy. So it's yeah. kind of hard to, to come by them. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, man, I, 
I will. I'll spread the word as much as I can about this movie, and I look forward to anything you do. You are you're like one of my favorite artistic entities. Oh man, and you I have really been like since that. since I first saw that stuff. I just I I love your work. Man, like I, I just I really do. I appreciate that a lot. I'm yeah. a, I'm a big believer in like the community, and as much as I kind of live in my cave, it is important for me for you know folks like yourself to kind of see this work and 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 f- hopefully feel like ah this is like my community that I'm yeah. a part of you oh, know? Yeah. and those have been some of the most rewarding things with the movie is that I, uh, a good buddy of mine uh, uh, Drew Saplin he's a writer director producer guy here in town he saw one of the early cuts of the movie this cast and crew screening and he kind of just went into this big monologue with me about how he's like this feels like our success he's like yeah. I know you made it oh, yeah. it's yeah, your yeah. movie yeah. but like this feels like something that w- like we can all be really proud of yeah. that exists Exactly. And that means the world to me. Yeah. And I'm like really happy to like have any part in that because, you know, it's this weird thing with the industry and I'm sure you're very aware of it with, with uh, the music side of things. But like you, nobody's coming to look for us. Nobody's yeah. coming to like discover something. It's right. like we, they only come after you've built it and yeah. after you've like established some uh, case study for success. Exactly right. You know, so like, this kind of emboldening of our community is sort of like all we have really at the end of the day is like you, you better appreciate the work because that's all you're guaranteed yeah. and you better appreciate the time and space and place that you're doing it in because like this this fantasy or this notion of like looking ahead or looking outward like somebody's going to come and snatch you up it's like it just doesn't happen yeah you know, maybe it did at one point in time and maybe it still happens to some people today, but it sure shit's not happening for me. Yeah. And the vast majority of, of people that I know who are uh, like all the people that I look up to, you know, they yeah. built it themselves. So uh, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that, that's cool. It means a lot. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very true. I've, and uh, you know what? I just, I just did a, I was just a judge at, for the Austin Music Video Awards, and I was just thinking, oh, yeah. we did a panel. Yes, we did. Them. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, yeah, and, and like stuff like that, you know? Like, I, you, you go to those things, and you're in a mood, and maybe you, you're judging the size of the audience, or you're, you know, you're, you're just yeah, kind of like, I, exactly. I don't know, yeah, yeah, what yeah. I, like, why am I doing this? But it was then, almost like, like we were in a cafeteria or something for that. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, almost. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, like, literally that panel in particular, I've had people... Uh, one musicians come up to me afterwards and be like, Hey, because of that panel that I saw you speak at, uh, like, I think you're the guy to make our music video. And then I get to go do a music video with them. Or, uh, you'll meet people that like, that was their first like week in Austin or something. And they saw that and it like had an effect, like a ripple effect. Yeah. Um, so it comes back to the thing, like you said earlier, is like trying to say yes to as much stuff as you can. Because you really have no idea how much it's gonna like reverberate out and then like come back to you, right? And, you know, and, and like really pay off, either emotionally or practically speaking. Where it's like uh, a band coming to you with money, and you know, it, and it turned out to be one of the only music videos I ever like got paid for, <laughs> you know, because ninety five percent of the time you end up you spend your own money on these things. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was a cool panel. I was I was I was in a salty mood that day. So you I, were? yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I you know, and I always try to be nice. I think I it's think that I was, Iowa nice, but <laughs> I was uh, I was stoked because you and Yvonne, a, a, a big uh, Octopus Project fan. I just I, yeah. was, I was glad to be like sitting there with you guys. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so yeah. I, I think I said one of the main reasons I said yes to it is because I, I love the Austin Music Video Film Festival and that you were, you know, oh, thanks, uh, man. curating it because these things like podcasts and the the interviewing things and just like kind of putting yourself out to are really hard. If the person on the other end of it doesn't know what they're doing. Right. Yo, yeah. You know, shit. I, I, I hate listening to myself on podcasts, but then every now and then it like works really well. And I'll go back and tell my uh, partner, you know, Joss, I'll be like, I think it went really well. That was a good conversation. And then you, then you stop to think about it. It's like, Oh, it's because this person's like, done hundreds of these they know what they're doing right you know they're or like this a, person is just fun to talk to you know yeah. what i mean yes yes yeah. so yeah well man this has been great talking to you people get out there and see the pizza gate massacre you can find it amazon 
Google, YouTube, you can rent it on all these places. Uh, Redbox uh, yeah, streaming. Yeah, Red, Redbox on demand. Uh, you're not going to find it outside of HEB, but like on their online right, right. VOD, uh, Apple TV, iTunes. Um, and then if you find us on our social media pages, like we have links to all that stuff. It's pretty yeah. easy. I'll put a link to it. Uh, both, both your Valley. johnvalleyworks.com, which is a fantastic website. Cool. And because uh, there's, man, those all the videos and all the... Your reels, your yeah. the short films, it's it's all you you're cool. You're a solid dude, man. Cool, you you man. need to be doing it. I'm glad you're doing this because you were meant to do this. Uh, it cer- certainly feels like it. Yeah. It's it's there is a compulsion at this point in my life where it's like I've had plenty of reason to quit and lots of signs from the universe to do so, but I just kind of keep But doing it's that it. thing you love like that same thing that I, you know, uh, in the Austin Music Foundation where I'm talking to people like there's no like if you're doing like I'm going to give myself a year and if I don't make it like, well, then just don't even fucking do it. Exactly. Because the thing is, is, you shouldn't care if you quote unquote make it or not. Yeah. Just the fucking doing it like that. The exercise of like yes. the journey, the making the music, the making the film, yes. the writing, the filming, like getting to a club when it's not open yet and smelling yeah. years of a club in the daytime. Yes. If that gets you excited, then you need to do this. But if it doesn't and you don't enjoy just like jamming with your friends, those are long ass days where you're not doing anything and you play for Correct. like, if you can make that 45 minutes to hour and a half be worth 24 hours in a day, then, you know, it's worth doing. It's so true. Yeah. So true, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, dude, I'm really proud of you. And, Thank you. and I'm really glad I know you and you just made You made a great fucking movie. You're a great actor. You're a great director, great writer. Appreciate that, man. Yeah. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. That's, that's like means the world when people reach out and they say like, Hey, I actually liked that thing. It's yeah. Like, Fuck. Yeah. 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 So I, I kind of knew I would like, that's the thing is like, I like, like, you know, there's some musicians that you, you just like the song that comes out of them, whatever song they're going to write. You're probably going to like it. Cause you like yeah. the, like I like your ideas and I figured if you're going to make a movie and put it out and I like your videos that much, then it, I probably would like this movie. I didn't that's know I would hear. like it as much as I did, but I did. Yeah. Good man. That's, yeah. that's super good to hear. It's cause that's all I can do. Yeah. <laughs> just make my stuff. So yeah. Yeah, well, that's cool. Thanks, man. Thanks for doing the show. Thank you very much for having me. That's John Valley. You can find the Pizzagate Massacre at thepizzagatemassacre.com. Get out there and watch the movie. It's absolutely fantastic. Let us know what you think of it. Let us know what you think of it. Do you believe in reptilians? Do you believe in lizard people? You can find John Valley at johnvalleyworks.com. I love talking to him. I'm glad we're friends. I hope we get to see each other more. And, uh, and I do. I'm a huge fan of his work. So go check out johnvalleyworks.com and definitely watch the Pizzagate Massacre. All right? Don't forget, gang, when you're out there checking out John Valley Works and the Pizza, uh, johnvalleyworks.com and the pizzagatemassacre.com that you can subscribe to this podcast wherever it is that you find podcasts, be it Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Tune in, Overcast, Stitcher. I almost forgot which ones they are. They're everywhere. Everywhere. New shows all the time. All right? Have a great weekend, whatever it is you're doing. Watch the Pizzagate Massacre with your family or, you know, with your, with your loved one. It's a good movie. Good movie. Go do it. Have a great weekend. Let's get down.
But if you wanna get up, give it all that you have. But who 